Um, thank you very much for the invite to talk today. I think what I'm going to try to do is set, hopefully, a little bit of context for the other speakers who are talking about families, but also I'm going to try to make some links with the rest of the topics throughout the day, and hopefully that will um, help hold some things together for you. Now, the slides that I'm presenting are not in your packs, um, but they will be available, um, I think, through Cerebra after the conference. What is in your pack um, is a briefing paper or a um, position paper from the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual and Now Developmental Disabilities from the Families um, Research Special Interest Group. And that storyline is going to be very similar to the one that I'm presenting to you today by way of context here. Um, but also, I'm going to be kind of embellishing a little um, because the position paper was very much a consensus approach of researchers internationally, and actually we applied very high standards to the quality of the evidence that we use to draw conclusions within that policy statement. And I'm going to perhaps play around the edges a little bit with um, some of the uh, evidence as I talk to you today. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially two things. I'm going to talk about this question of actually whether um, parents may be affected by raising a child with um, developmental disability is going to be my focus. And so I'm talking about children with intellectual disabilities, learning disability in the UK, um, and autism, or a combination of those. So I'm going to talk about parents. I'm also going to think about um, whether there's any evidence that siblings are affected in some way. And as Chris kindly introduced, I'm going to talk about um, you know, the, the way that we often sell um, to try to get funding for research, you know, how terrible it can be for some families, but also I'm going to talk about the positive aspects of functioning in families, parents and siblings too. And I'm going to end with a little summary which, I'm, where I'm going to draw out what I think may be some of the kind of fairly straightforward implications for family support. So obviously families are thought of in terms of a system, and systems theorists over many decades have basically talked about the idea that if well-being in one family member is up or down, that is likely to affect other individuals in the family, but also other subsystems within the family. So basically, families, family members are in, interconnected. Not a complex idea, but it's important in terms of some of the conclusions I'm going to be drawing. And of course, we've recognized for a long time and known for a long time that children and adults actually with developmental disabilities are at risk for all sorts of difficulties, including some adaptive skill deficits, but also behavioral excesses, challenging behaviors, sleep difficulties, feeding difficulties, etc., and also mental health difficulties. So it's kind of pretty clear that um, some, the well-being of the person with developmental disability in the family might be something that affects the family more broadly. And there's been a particular interest in research terms in parents and in siblings, which is what I'm going to focus on today, but also some research focused on other family members, in particular grandparents. And the, essentially the assumption um, with lots of research, and there's plenty of research kind of supporting this idea, and I'm going to explore this a little in, in what I say, the assumption is essentially that families are experiencing negative outcomes, parents in particular are experiencing negative outcomes, that they're experiencing more stress, more depression, and other kind of negative well-being measures um, when compared to other parents. And this is quite interesting because actually, if you look at population-based databases, so large-scale databases, for example, of UK population, and you look at variables that seem to be associated with people's well-being, being a parent, generally, seems to be associated with better well-being. All of those of you who are parents may not quite believe that, <laughs> but it does seem to come out in the literature. So in that context, the fact that perhaps parents of children with developmental disabilities are reporting more difficulties is perhaps um, something we should take more notice of. One of the problems, though, um, don't get distracted by this slide, one of the problems, though, is that with existing research is that Many research studies are very focused on what are essentially quite biased samples. So they're often parents who are known to services, and obviously parents known to services are known to services for a reason, or they're parents perhaps who are in contact with support organisations or charities. And you know, those parents are showing an interest in those support organisations and charities, so they are likely to be different than the whole population of parents of children with developmental disabilities. 
And what's been really useful recently, um, very recently really, is that for the first time probably we've had access to very large scale population based databases um, across the UK that have enabled us to start to look at parental well-being and also child well-being too, but on a population based sample, so not using those kind of referred sample biases. So I'm going to show you some data from some of those studies which actually tend to reinforce the results of previous research, but I think for the first time give us some real confidence in what we've been seeing and help us to understand the, perhaps the extent of that. So I'm going to talk first about the Office for National Statistics Child and Adolescent Mental Health Surveys, which were carried out in 1999 and 2004 on over 18,000 children in, across all the four countries of the UK. Five to 16 years of age, the children were at the time of the survey, and they had a very high response rate. They selected um, children through child benefit records, and at the moment, before the changes, um, you'll know that that's a very good way of finding children within the UK. Most children and families are registered for child benefit. So a very good response rate in terms of finding those children, so a really good population-based data set. Within that data set, and this is important for one of the differences I'm going to show you. There were clinically based interviews with the a family carer and with the child where they were old enough and able to participate to enable um, uh, WHO ICD-10 clinical diagnoses to be drawn. And in particular, um, 98 children within the whole sample met criteria for a diagnosis of autism, which... Um, is significant on the next slide when I'll show you in a minute. Now, to find the children with intellectual disability within the sample, um, Eric Emerson from Lancaster University developed a way of identifying a subset within that whole population database of children who were identified as being on statements of special educational need, having developmental delays, current communication difficulties and the like. And he combined all those data to say, well, here's a group of children that look like they've got the characteristics we'd expect of children with intellectual disability. And that ended up being just over 3% of the total sample, which might sound like quite a lot, but is actually quite, for those of you who've been interested in epidemiological data, is quite similar to the best estimates of intellectual disability, learning disability across a population, around 3% of children. So it seems to be quite a good way of identifying that subgroup of kids. For those of you who are interested in autism, um, these population-based data suggest that, the, that around 50% of children with autism also have an intellectual disability. Again, that matches with other population data sets across um, the world at the moment. So it's probably quite a good estimate. And what I wanted to show you was these data, because as part of the survey, um, not only was child and adolescent mental health a focus, but mothers, or actually a primary parental caregiver, responded about their own health too. And I've shown you on this slide two sets of data um, on a kind of clinical screening tool in the red for emotional disorder. Um, I'm showing the percentage of mothers that report levels of symptoms that meet that clinical cutoff. And also, I'm showing you separately high positive mental health, a positive mental health measure that was included in the survey or can be extracted from the survey. Focus for a moment on the red bars. And basically what you see is over, well over 40% of any child with autism only or autism and intellectual disability, the mothers are reporting levels of emotional problems above that or in that clinical kind of concern range. So quite high uh, percentages. Slightly lower the rest of the children with intellectual disability um, in the sample, excluding those with also um, ASD. And lower again um, the control children, which is the rest of the children in the whole population database. And those differences uh, between the children with developmental dis or mothers of children with developmental disabilities and the controls are statistically significant, if you're interested, and you can see why. Interestingly, though, although positive mental health looks to be kind of slightly reduced um, in the reports of the mothers of children with autism, actually those differences are not reliable across those groups. So it looks like, although you get that classic pattern perhaps of negative outcomes being different for mothers when they have a child with developmental disability, and perhaps autism being a particularly high risk group, you don't get that perhaps negative impact on positive well-being, if you like. I'm going to come back to this pattern a couple of times. So by the time 
children are at the age of between 5 and 16, so across essentially school age, mothers are already reporting um, significant um, negative mental health outcomes or high levels of stress or whatever way you measure it. So the, there's an interesting question about, well, if it's established by the time that children are of school age, when does that start to emerge within families? When do families first start to show signs of being affected perhaps by the child within the family or, or something about the child within the family? And so we've also looked at another national population database. So again, having those advantages of being um, not based on biased samples, the Millennium Cohort Study, which, as it suggests, is um, live births in the year 2000. Over 15,000 children followed up now several times, and I'm just showing you data when the children were age five today. Again, I'm going to show you those same four subgroups. So this time, autism was reported by the parents. We didn't have an additional clinical diagnosis there. But actually, intellectual disability was better defined because there was an IQ test within the, or a developmental test within the database. So we could select out children who had a score of an IQ of uh, estimate of se uh, below 70. And again, that ends up about 3% of the population. So again, pretty good estimate probably of identifying uh, that subpopulation of children with intellectual disability. I'm going to talk, focus on the negative outcomes, but also make a quick comment about some others. So there was a measure of serious mental illness, the Kessler-6, and a measure of psychological distress, the SF-8. And so again, very similar graph. Remember, these are mothers now reporting, and their child is at, the, all of the children are five years of age. And as you can see, in terms of both these negative outcomes, psychological distress and serious mental illness, essentially compared to the controls, all the three developmental disability groups are scoring higher in terms of overall symptoms. And those differences are you know, reliable statistically. There's not a kind of obvious pattern as to who's perhaps at most risk, and these are very small numbers. Um, so, but basically, by the age of five, those differences or those potential negative impacts in particular on the families have started to emerge. When we looked also, at, there was a measure of um, physical health difficulties that mothers reported on, on their own physical health as well. And actually there it was the mothers of children with ASD who were reporting most negative physical health impact um, when their child was age five. When we looked at life satisfaction, a positive outcome, again, we got exactly the same pattern as before. So no differences across the groups, no reliable differences across the groups. So it looks like problems emerge very early, certainly by age five, sometime in that period. And perhaps autism, parents of children with autism, in particular mothers with the focus at the moment, I'll come to fathers in a minute, I won't forget them like Chris did. Um, <laughs> are you know, particularly perhaps negatively affected um, when they have a child with autism, so maybe a high-risk group. So if you've got autism as a high-risk group, there are other ways to start to look at, well, um, how does that compare in detail when you start to match up children and compare them when they've got other disabilities? So is it something about autism that perhaps is leading to some of these difficulties for mothers, or is it just the fact that perhaps they have an underlying intellectual disability? From the population database, it looks like there is something additional about autism. But we've also explored this in other work. So um, Gemma Griffith looked at a quite a small sample of mothers of children with autism, mothers of children with Down syndrome, and a mixed etiology intellectual disability group. And very closely matched them in terms of the child's gender and age, uh, I think the mother's age as well, but also their standard score for communication on the vinyl and adaptive behavior scale. So these children all had kind of a similar level of um, disability overall. So they were quite closely matched. And so she compared uh, both two negative outcomes to start with, mothers reporting here. And as you see, basically we get the same kind of pattern again. It does look like that autism, mothers of children with autism are particularly at risk for reporting negative outcomes. It does support that idea, both for stress um, and in white for um, depression, although for depression the uh, differences are not quite so stark. And again, if we come to come back to positive um, measures, so life satisfaction in red and daily reported positive affects, so positive emotion that mothers report feeling day to day, again, there are then no group differences. Sorry. And we've also explored 
Well, if autism are a particularly high-risk group, that's quite a helpful benchmark to start to look at whether there may be or other um, high-risk um, groupings of families and parents reporting on uh, raising a child with disability uh, with a particular kind of disability. And this is a study we did actually with Chris's team in, in Birmingham using um, mothers this time of children with autism and intellectual disability as a benchmark group, but then comparing three different um, rare syndrome groups. So Angelman syndrome, Cornelia de Lange syndrome and Cree de Char syndrome. And here again, both positive and negative outcomes. So in red, negative outcome, mothers reporting stress, and in white, uh, positive outcome, day-to-day -day positive affect. And you can see that although um, two of the syndrome groups are on, a on pretty much a par or lower than the autism benchmark, a very high-risk group, actually, um, through this research, we identified potentially another high higher even risk group of mothers of children with Angelman syndrome. Um, I don't know whether that might be commented on later about a reason for, for that, um, but we've also got these positive data, and again, no differences across the groups again. So although we get negative differences, negative outcome differences, we don't get positive ones. So the question is, well, what's underlying this increased risk? Because it doesn't seem to be perhaps the intellectual disability, because even when you control for that, you're still getting group differences. It seems to potentially be something about autism, but is there another variable? And of course, for those of you who kind of know the literature and think about the families that you know as well, Probably a candidate variable you all have come up with is, you know, children engage, uh, are much more likely when they've got developmental disabilities to engage in behaviour problems of various kinds. And it does seem to be that in the research literature that comes through as a variable to help us to understand what's most stressful for parents. So behaviour problems very broadly defined, both those kind of classic challenging behaviours, aggression type behaviours, but also feeding difficulties, sleep difficulties, uh, behavioural sleep difficulties and such like. Now what we did with the um, Office of National Statistics data set was also to look at well, what variables predict maternal emotional disorder outcomes. And basically across the whole sample, you're almost twice more mothers of a child with um, any elevated level of behaviour problems were almost twice as likely to report symptoms in that clinical range for emotional disorder. And these are all independent effects and also after controlling for child age, gender and family socioeconomic position. So it's not explained by those variables. So behaviour problems add almost a, twice the risk. Autism also adds an additional almost twice the risk on its own. And although not statistically significant, there is an effect of intellectual disability as well. So it does look like behaviour problems and ASD are kind of two of our key variables here in understanding some of the variability in parent um, responses. And I'm not going to show you the kind of evidence that supports all of this, but I'm going to summarise a kind of family system here and just very briefly and quickly talk through it. So, and this is where I mentioned fathers, look, just to be clear that I'd already thought about them beforehand. Um, so if we're interested in thinking about the relationship between mother well-being, child well-being and partner well-being, so one of the kind of subsystems within a, a typical sort of family, or maybe not so typical nowadays, but one of the models of family that we would see, then there is a very clear relationship between child behaviour problems in terms of the child with disability and mother's well-being. There's also actually evidence not so strong and probably the effects are not so strong either, but also evidence that children's behaviour problems affects father well-being. Through longitudinal research designs, following families up over time, it's also quite clear that um, mother's well-being is a context for affecting children's well-being. Not only their development, as we see more broadly um, in the psychological child development literature, but, you know, so for example, mothers who are depressed, you know, children often experience some developmental difficulties, but child behaviour problems seem to be exacerbated over time in a family context where mothers in particular are quite stressed. So there is a two-way relationship here, supported by longitudinal data studies. There isn't a two-way relationship that is reliably there for fathers, which is why I've got an arrow going one way, and mothers, in terms of the family system, um, this is more tentative evidence and won't be in the position paper you've got, really. Um, mothers' uh, well-being seems to be affected by both 
their partner's well-being and also the child. But partner's well-being doesn't seem to be um, reliably related to um, mother's well-being. I'm sure you can think of lots of hypotheses about that. And there's also an assumption, so moving on to siblings, that siblings are going to be negatively affected. So there's probably some professional assumptions here, and also certainly in terms of when you talk to parents, some, some parental worries about siblings within the family. So for example, you know, thinking that parental attention is going to be diverted to so the demands of caring for a child with developmental disability. There's an interesting one around sibling relationships. In the broader child development literature, having a positive relationship with your sibling is quite protective for later ongoing uh, positive well-being. And if you've got an impoverished sibling relationship, perhaps because it's difficult to maintain one, then that might be something that you know, could affect siblings in families of children with disability. And peers may well ostracize and isolate siblings. Um, and perhaps in some families, siblings are, um, there are increased caregiving expectation, perhaps mat and maturity demands placed on siblings, that they might help out with the care of their brother or sister, for example, when they've got very complex needs. And I'm going to just show you some brief data. So this is a kind of um, classic study. So using um, a measure called the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, um, looking at overall behavioural and emotional problems in siblings of, ch of th um, three groups of children. So there's um, normative data in the pinky colour, and then two subgroups. So the, um, a group of siblings who have a, a brother or sister with autism and also intellectual disability, and then a group of siblings who, who have a brother or sister with intellectual disability only. And basically, there are no differences across the groups. Between the two groups, or between those two disability groups and the normative data for the UK, except in emotional problems, where uh, brothers and sisters of children with autism and intellectual disability had higher levels of emotional problems reported by their parents. Otherwise, there are no differences across these groups. And this is interesting because it reflects a kind of general pattern in the sibling literature, that sometimes you find some evidence of negative impact on siblings, but also a number of studies, and, and actually when we counted them up very roughly a few years ago, it's roughly 50-50, um, a number of other studies find no negative impact on siblings at all. Probably there are some extremes in here. There are some children, some siblings who are affected quite significantly by something about um, the impact of the child or their brother or sister with disability on the family system. But actually there are probably also some positive benefits for some siblings too, and they tend to, when you do these group type studies, perhaps cancel each other out. So these neg um, evidence for negative impact on siblings is actually not very strong at all across the best designed research literature. And when people have done what are called meta-analysis summaries, so summarizing the statistical evidence across a bunch of research studies, the overall effect, negative impact on siblings is very small, nowhere near the kind of size it is potentially for, for example, understanding mother well-being. And again, I'm not gonna show you the research evidence in detail, but I'm gonna summarize the kind of family subsystem here, the relationship between the child with disability and their non-affected, typically developing brother or sister. And again, it's not actually, um, one of the key variables that seems to start to emerge from the literature is again this behavior problems variable. So actually, there's good evidence, both from cross-sectional, so at one point in time, and also longitudinal studies, where you get a better idea of how things, um, how variables relate to each other over time and might kind of cause each other. There's good evidence that there is a one-directional arrow here between um, the behavior problems that children with disabilities may present with and their own siblings' well-being. It looks like siblings exposed to a brother or sister with high levels of behavior problems are gonna be more likely to have behavior problems themselves. And interestingly, it doesn't go the other way. So having a sibling with high levels of problems doesn't seem to act as a context for difficulties for, um, at least in behavior problems for a child with developmental disability themselves. Now here, if I hadn't done uh, my slides on a Mac and expected the picture not to appear here, there would have been a picture of an elephant. <laughs> so instead, there's the word elephant in the room. Um, 
And although what I think is interesting is that the focus in the family research literature has been on mostly on the, um, the relatives of somebody with disability, so parents and siblings, trying to work out are they affected in some way, are they affected negatively, are they affected positively perhaps. There is literature, as I've kind of indicated in those summary systems diagrams, that suggests that family context also um, is something important to understand when we're thinking about the difficulties that children with disabilities have. So there is that kind of reverse direction, although not much of it. And although there's lots of research asking parents and asking siblings what it's like to have a child with disability in the family, one of the things that's clearly missing from the literature and one of the most neglected areas is actually understanding well, what do children with disabilities think about family? What do they understand about family? And what does family mean to them? And I think this is a really significant area to help us to understand the full context and the full system. So we've, um, I'm just going to show you very briefly some um, data from a study we've completed fairly recently where we interviewed 12 adolescents who had a diagnosis of Asperger's or high-functioning autism. Um, and they were all... Uh, nearly all male, and nearly all the older sibling in the family. And, so we're, and we asked them about their relationship with their siblings. That's as simple as that. We talked to young people with autism about their sibling relationships using a um, very detailed qualitative analysis methodology that some of you may have heard of called interpretive phenomenological analysis. And I get an extra cake for being able to say that without stumbling. Um, we identified kind of two really strong themes. What really came over as very powerful was that the siblings talked about, well, these young people with autism talked about their sibling relationships in very typical ways. That was the overwhelming um, impression, as it were, from the data. But they also identified some kind of subtle differences. So just very quickly, a couple, some quotes that kind of support this kind of typical sibling relationships thing. It's encapsulated by this idea that, well, that's just brothers for you. you know, so very, very kind of typical comments. So things like, well, you know, we, we tend to get into arguments, but that's what brothers are for. Oh, she's a lovely little girl talking about his sister. She's a big part of my life. I really don't know what I'd do without her, actually. I'd be bored stiff. <laughs> um, she gives, she's a playmate, she's a great sister, very loving and popular at school, and we both get on very well together. And remember, these are adolescents with autism talking. Always look out for each other. We're best buds. Basically, if you're brothers, then you're put in, not put in this world for nothing. Your brother, me and Adria, we were put on this earth to spend time with each other and joke and muck about and do some pretty crazy stuff, always looking out for each other. So very, very typical. And then there was also this kind of underlying theme of actually they were quite aware of that their autism also ha had some subtle effects for them in terms of the sibling relationship. So autism basically can have a really big impact on that sibling relationship. I can be a bit violent, unintentionally hurt her, makes me feel guilty. Um, I'm a bit of an arsehole doing that but she's very supportive. And having autism means that we don't do stuff together. You know, his brother has very different interests to him, wanting to go out with his friends, but actually he doesn't like going into town because that's too kind of noisy and busy. So in terms of implications, I think there are some sniff... If you look at the kind of highest quality research evidence, there are significant vulnerabilities for families. Autism, it looks like, behaviour problems, parental mental health is clearly an issue, parental physical health seems to be a, an issue too, and services clearly need to act to support those um, needs. What I think I really want to emphasise is, is this idea that, if you like, positive family functioning appears to be, in quotes, intact in families, and also it's important to remember that children with developmental disabilities do have um, a level of pro-social behaviours that one could build on too. So some positive focus would be quite interesting. Working with one part of the family system is clearly going to impact on the rest. Um, and so intervention as well, when we think about the data in terms of where problems emerge, must be proactive and must be early. And we basically need a model that helps to support the child with disability, but also provides family members, I think, with skills to help them cope with the difficulties of raising a child, but also the contact with services that they need to manage too. And thank you, I'm going to end there, because <laughs> I've been told to. <clears throat>